All right, excited to be here today with Tony Corelli. So Tony has collaborated with thousands of artists, both locally and nationally. He's worked with several Grammy-winning musicians, and he's become a respected figure in the music industry, especially in the Baltimore area. Uh, he's actually developed a highly acclaimed modified microphone, uh, which has been used with major bands like Steely Dan, Tool, Fish, Rage Against the Machine. And you know, he's, he's really built up a community in a space in Baltimore in particular. And so I'm looking forward to connecting with him today to talk about the creative process, you know, being a musician and collaboration, you know, building a scene in your local area and kind of what that means for us as, you know, modern musicians in terms of being creative, especially in the world with AI and, you know, more creative tools at our disposal. You know, how do we really build a network and collaborate more? So, mm -hmm. Tony, thanks so much for taking the time to be here today. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually That's in awesome. a uh, so, recording session right now. <laughs> we just kind of paused it for this. So the artists went out to get some lunch and we're doing this interview and... I'm pretty much doing this just around the clock, just to stay a night in the studio, which I love. But I'm glad to be here with you guys. That's awesome. That's awesome. I appreciate you taking a little bit of a break from the from the music creation to come create a different kind of different kind of music. Exactly. So Still talking to musicians. Uh, maybe I, to kick things off, could you just share a little bit more detail about your story and kind of how you got started in the Baltimore music scene and starting to work with with so many artists? Yeah, I've, I've played in bands and recorded a keyboard player. So I feel like keyboard players are like naturally arrangers. A lot of synths have sequencers on it. So in middle school and high school, I was arranging songs on my keyboard. And when I would meet songwriters at school, we'd get together and I would like make some music using four track cassette tape back then. So I would play, I would sequence everything mm -hmm. and then we would play the keyboard and play the live tracks. So I would sing on one mic and I would play guitar into the other one. So it was pretty natural going from that very primitive system to learning other recording and went, got into recording right after that. So really right out of high school, I started recording. I still have my network of friends from high school that were all ready to start recording and doing more with their band. So that was my like core, like I guess, base of musicians I was working with. And then bands break up. And when bands break up, a lot of times I record all the pieces of it. So as bands break up, it multiplies, which is kind of funny paradox. I'm trying to keep the peace with everybody. Hmm. And then sometimes if someone splinters off, I'm like, all right, well, now it's two projects. <laughs> but between that, that got me started. Hmm. And I just do it day and night. So a year or two, I had my demo tapes. And they were really cassette tapes. I mean, like it was, I was right at the end of that whole analog thing. So I started in an analog and then I did digital tape with an analog mixer. We were making cassette tapes, CDs weren't as common. And then it went to CDs and then just immediately it's streaming and all digital. So it was a lot of changes in a short period of time. But luckily I got my start and, and really got to experience all those changes and followed it and just stay cutting edge here. I mix a lot of stuff in Dolby Atmos, which is like the newest format instead of 5.1 or instead of mono stereo or 5.1, this is up to 128 channels of immersive audio, a lot more complicated. So it's, it's definitely fun doing that and seeing all these changes over the years. Mm. Awesome. Yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your perspective around, you know, witnessing that evolution from analog to digital. And yeah, I, I wasn't really in the music scene back then, but I've talked with some people who witnessed that shift from kind of out of the box to in the box and the kind of resistance to it from the previous model to the new model and all oh, this is going to ruin music. And, you know, eventually, you know, it, it really untapped, you know, like it, it allowed us to be more creative. And right now, as I'm recording this, we're experiencing this potential major shift in how music's created with major uh, yeah. AI tools. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious to hear your thoughts around having been through that experience from like analog to digital, what were some of the interesting things that, that you noticed and how did you make that, that shift, what, what kind of impact did it make for you to kind of be on the cutting edge? And how do you see what's happening right now in terms of music generation with AI? And how can someone get like really on the cutting edge with that? Yeah, I mean, as, a, as an engineer, tools are always good. I'm always looking for new things to help me create. The classic bands, the, the Beatles are a great example, band that was always cutting edge. They, mm -hmm. they always got, I mean, they named a lot of effects, like Flanger was named by John Lennon because people were bringing stuff to them, like, try this thing out. Mm -hmm. They were, the, with the, the bands would try to get as many tracks as they could. They could they could sync two tape machines up instead of 16 tracks, now 24 tracks. Wait, we could sync two together in four, 48 tracks. Now we have unlimited tracks. So, yeah, I mean, everybody can misuse anything. So that was, a, that was a concern. Like, what if we have too many tracks and we put too much in songs? But like, Bohemian Rhapsody and some of these songs just had it. They did as much as they could. They just had some track limits and they would 
bounce stuff down and do other stuff. So everybody has always used the tools to make the best music they make. And I think we look back and romanticize that sometimes like, oh, they did it this way, which is humbling because when you think about the Beatles doing what they did with less than what we have, if you buy a Mac laptop now, you have more than the Beatles had. I mean, <laughs> you can do these unlimited track counts on GarageBand. You got great sounds, right? It, I mean, it used to be if you wanted a sound, you needed that big unit into your space and it would be expensive and it would be hard to do. So I love having more tools in people's hands. I do know that, there, I mean, there's a lot of, of course, a lot of threats from AI to, to different things. One thing that I know right away is like sync music, background music for corporate stuff. To me, that's like, it's done. I mean, it, it's just gonna be generative. It's okay, I didn't get into that work. I actually resisted that work. I have a sync rep and I never wanted my songs in libraries. I just don't like that idea of a library full of generic background music, but I also understand there's people that make, that play keyboard that can just do that all day, crank those things out and they used to get paid for doing that. And that's maybe gone. We're gonna be gone next year. I don't know, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a major disruption. I would say this is, I mean, definitely more, a, a bigger impact than how the engineers ultimately get their sound. There wasn't a huge, difference when we switch from digital from analog tape to digital tape digital tape to hard disk i mean there are all differences in the way we the way it's handled behind the scenes but this is this is of course a much more significant difference so that's a lot to talk about but but i'm glad that ultimately glad that it, it gives a lot to songwriters songwriters can develop stuff some some songwriters come in to me with ideas and i develop them and i think that there's definitely value in that in, in working with a producer it's very different than you got to generate it and you got to tell it what you want it to do instead of having an actual collaborator. So there's definitely going to be limits when you don't have a human with you. I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, the humans are going to do better. It's like, I know the machines can do a great job on the arranging. I don't totally get that. But I think that if you're, if you want to collaborate people, if you want a real producer, that's a little bit of a different thing. If you just want to sound like a certain artist, then you could copy it with the robot and I don't think you should sound like other artists. I think you should try to be original. I think if you're scraping the internet and looking for other stuff to copy off of, I mean, what if what if those things, the machines just ran on their own for a couple of years and just all music averages out into one average sound? <laughs> just because, one note. Because, yeah, because it all just, it just keeps recycling every, it just keeps, you know, finding the common denominator of every song until it just works. So somebody's got to make the original content, so. I, hmm. And and my studio is geared for making original content. I have a huge tracking room. I can do a whole orchestra in here. I can do big band. I do a lot of strings and stuff. So so my studio is set up for people who want to come in and bang their drums and play a tube amp nice and loud and bring in a real string section. Now I realize if you're a songwriter and you want a string section behind you, you don't got the time and money. It might be nice to say, hey AI, make me a string arrangement. And I'm going to say it'll be a good arrangement. I'm an arranger, but I know that these things can do a good job. But if you're an actual violinist or you want to work with violinists and cellists, then you're still going to need a physical space to do it. So, so I'm glad I still have, have space for it. So that's my, that's my take on AI. Mm, super interesting. Yeah. I mean, it definitely seems like we're, we're still in the phase where AI alone is not as good as AI plus human, you know, it's really like the humans prompting the AI. And I mean, within the music space, it seems like in the last few days, you know, we've had some huge breakthroughs. Have you seen the UDO, UDO.com? We're sharing some, some songs from it. Just um, insane. I didn't mess dude. with it myself, but people I know that mess with it, they're saying, they're like, oh, it's over, guys. <laughs> <laughs> for beat makers. And maybe it is for beat makers, especially the ones that didn't know what they were doing. And, and mm. that sounds kind of harsh, but. There were there are people that just put stuff together. They were given building blocks and in uh, fruity loops and other things, and they were putting stuff together. Maybe it was interesting, but they were ultimately coloring by numbers. And it, if you are doing that, then yeah, the, the AI is going to knock that out right away. And UDO, yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, the point that you brought up around the first thing to go will be like background music or you know, things that are used in like sync, you know, placements that don't really have a signature characteristic where it's like, it should be about like the artist or something that someone recognizes. It seems like that's, unfortunately, you know, my heart goes out to everyone who's like, that's their livelihood, but it's yeah. like, yeah. but like, that's how, I mean, it's so much easier to just like, you type in what you want, click a button and then you have it and be able to iterate on it. It'd be really interesting to see what happens in terms of like, you know, original artists using it to generate demos or generate a track that they can then 
I don't know, use Moises to like remove the stems and then have a fully built out track, you know, for them to record stuff on top of it, it's wild, man. You, you would, based on the world that you're in, like, I think you'd really be blown away by the udio.com tools specifically. I mean, everyone that's listening to this right now, if you haven't checked it out yet, udio.com, there's one before, gosh, what was it called? Suno.ai. I see um, that which, one too. That one was cool. That one, I mean, I played around with it. I'm like, wow, like that's that's cool. But I'm like, eh, like it's still like pretty robotic. And it's like, eh, it's not quite there. Udo.com, like there's a bunch of songs that I'm like, I would not have known this was generated by AI. And they have some really good tools for like trimming the edges where you can add an intro or an outro. And you can like create legitimate songs, at least like songs that are 80 to 90 percent of the way there and then there's just like a few lines that are a little bit weird we were like yeah i might change that line but i'm just imagining you know like someone like yourself or a producer that is really good with the tools who can you know take out the stems and add their own pieces add different vocals on top just how quickly and easily you can create high quality music uh just mind-blowing yeah yeah, and the again in my in my space, like I'm I'm working right now with a hard rock band, American Jet Set. They're on Golden Robot Records, so they're a live band that plays. And the drummer came in with his drum kit. Not AI is not going to impact that recording, not in the not in the foreseeable future, because they're a live band, which I think artists need to need to concentrate on right now. If you hmm. were just putting music out online, these tools every month are just advancing so much. So people with no musical talent could start prompting these things and who knows what they're going to come up with. So I, I think musicians need to make sure they get good on their instruments live, good on performing. But in this case, I was saying the band is performing their songs. We're recording their songs. So in that case, we're not looking to create anything other than what they're, what they are physically doing, what they could do in a rehearsal space, which mm -hmm. is a very different thing than a, than a solo artist who maybe doesn't play an instrument and needs a track made for them. Hmm. Makes a ton of sense. Yeah. It's like playing live and uh, that'll be an interesting litmus test of the AI is like when a robot can perform live with a band and they can actually follow along <laughs> and, and like do stuff back and forth and definitely yeah. there hologram go, people. But... Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think on the, on the larger scale, like when it comes to sync, a, a cool song at a big scene for a show, you still want that to be an artist, you know, people like to see artists live to connect with artists to look at their social media content, which hopefully stays real because people could start to have the, the bots start to write their statuses for them and stuff. I mean, it's probably already <laughs> happening, but it's the lower level of just the, I think you said that like the, the less the script, like just background music that, that might, that might go, mm -hmm. but hopefully people are still looking for connection to artists and to start to like somebody because you start to have a, because a lot of the people who have the best following, there's a personal connection that people have, or they feel like they're a community of the fans of that band. And uh, you'll definitely lose mm. community if there's no live shows. So if, if it's just mm. generative AI virtual band, I, I don't know if people would wear their shirts. <laughs> I'm wearing a band shirt right now. I always am. Low is one of my favorite bands. And when I go to a low show, like it's my type of people. We talk about uh, just the, philosophical implications of their songs and their theology or whatever hmm. you I, I imagine you wouldn't get that i, I don't know We're, we'll see but if there's a virtual band i feel like you wouldn't wear the virtual band shirt and like you may not have as that same type of thing so so there's there's those kind of benefits to, the, to being a live musician that i think musicians need to really lean into as as people are going to be able to make stuff online. If you're, if you're only putting your stuff online and promoting it onto playlists and stuff, it's going to get really competitive. I saw somebody just release something, just, just mm -hmm. a local person. I don't know, but I, I think it was all AI made. It's okay if they did it, did it, but I'm like, now people are like, I made this song and it's like, okay, well, it's not actual singer and you're, you're prompting it. If it's good, it's good. But I, I think focus on being able to actually perform the songs and, and connect with people. Mm hmm. That's it. Yeah, you, you nailed it. It seems like the biggest, the most important thing to focus on is is about the connection and the community building. And I, there's an early point you made too around like the tools, you know, as, as really different scale, different type of revolution, but with like from analog to digital, because mm -hmm. it sounded like that was a similar thing in some ways where you know, people were like, it's not real because it's in the box. And, you know, there's even some concerns that like, you know, this is going to hurt our ears because it's not like actually real music. 
and then over time, like we came to understand the, well, like you, you have these tools that make it easier, but it's still about that creativity. It's still about, you know, you as an artist kind of deciding how these things come together and, and creating this based on this idea, this intention. And it does seem like with AI tools now, even the ones that are like, you know, generating some songs that are like fully fleshed out songs, it's still not quite there on its own, right? It's like, it's more, it's just a tool. It's like, if you can use it as a tool, to speed up your workflow, but you can also, it's kind of like having a chainsaw. You know, if you're gonna use a chainsaw, like you wanna use it in the right way, or if you're gonna <laughs> sculpt a ice sculpture, it's gonna be faster to do it with like a you know, better tool for it. But you, it, what matters is still the creativity, you know, the artwork around it, and ultimately about the connection and the community that, that you're building around it. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I went on a little bit of soap, soapbox there, but cool, man. So let's talk about the that that piece of it, the connection, the community building, and the live, you know, the the live interaction. What are some creative things that you see an artist doing nowadays that have helped them to actually build like a really tight knit, strong community that actually you know supports the music and to actually build a music scene? Yeah, well, it's really cool that it's easy to find other musicians in your area online. So this connection is great. Mm -hmm. I, I talk, things have changed so quickly. Like I'm not like, I'm not young, but I'm not like super old, but like it was a very different time 20 years ago when to meet other musicians, you would go to a show and you had a flyer for your upcoming show and you had to like make sure you talk to the person to tell them what you were up to. Now it's very easy to say I'm, I'm playing here and I'll tag everybody, but it's easy to connect with other musicians. If you see a band, in your area and they have a, a cellist or some musician that, that you might want to work with. It's very easy to find these people and connect with them. So it's easy to make these initial contacts, which is great. Uh, we can do meaningful stuff now where you can do a song and people can hear it. You don't have to, I like forming a live band, but you don't have to be able to make a huge commitment to playing a bunch of shows and rehearsals. You can say, come in this one afternoon, we're going to do a song together and then we'll promote it and people will be able to hear it. So there's a lot of opportunities for that kind of thing. And so, so I would say for musicians to connect with every musician you find that, that you're interested in, in, in your area, like listen to people's stuff. It's easy to take the time to do it. It's easy to like their follow, you know, follow their pages, subscribe them on, on Spotify. Artists love any kind of feedback. We all know it. Isn't that like such a common problem? You post something stupid and everybody talks about it. You post some song that you really put a lot of time and effort into. And you really, it, it's nice to know someone really heard it. What, if another musician writes in, I love the vocals, you know, those lyrics are really well thought out. That's really exciting for an artist. You really like love that kind of feedback. And it's, it's easy to go around and give that kind of feedback and be real about it. I mean, I don't mean, you know, to say nice things, to, but there's usually you can find the good in anything if you want to. I mean, it, bands uh, have, different focuses different strengths and weaknesses so so find those things and and i think complement other bands connect with other bands and as you're working on something if you think somebody else's sound and style fits what you're doing try to try to get them in try to connect and when you're when you're working on a song if it's a song you've written and you bring somebody into it hopefully the person fits into it but it's it's cool to be able to say this is my song these are the, the general borders general feel of my song let's let this other person in and still fit what we're working on but like add just another shade, just some, some more color coloration of theirs to it. And it, and it makes it a more interesting song, especially if you're going to keep making songs. It's just good to, good to have some other, some other styles thrown in there. hundred mm, percent. Yeah. It's sort of like when you have a baby and you have multiple different people come together and the baby is sort of, it has the DNA of, of its parents, but it's more interesting. It's unique because it kind of has these different strands of DNA where mm -hmm. if it's just like, if, if it's the exact same family thread that just keeps that there's no new DNA, then it's bad. So there's all sorts of bad things that happen from, from that, from ancestral relationships. So it seems like <laughs> yeah. similar kind of thing with, with music too. Yeah. And the prompting, if, if you're the, the prompt prompter, is that we, what do we call the person who generates the generative the, AI? The prompt engineer <laughs> is the official the, the term. Prompt, the promptest, <laughs> the promptifier. Well, mm. that likes Billie Eilish is like, all right, do this in the style of Billie Eilish. And it's like, it's going to, again, it's going to average you out after a while if you're not mixing up those styles. And mm. if there's no Billie Eilish to feed the, the scraping of the robots, then, then, you know, there's, there's just going to, there's always going to be need for the, for the people to create, to give AI something to steal. 
<laughs> sad reality of it. And I mean, obviously that's really affecting the visual arts, but the visual artists, people, the, the thing needs to look at a style of something. Oh, and the style of this person. Okay. So we mm. still need these people to make these styles for the thing to copy off of. And, yeah. and a, a way to do that is just to keep expanding your horizons, take, take a broad amount of influences. If you're in a certain like genre of music, step out of it, listen to some other stuff, find, find the good in, in other, other genres. I, I love jazz, I love jazz piano really opened my mind to a lot of things about piano. And when I talk to other rock guys, a lot of the, a lot of the musicians that I really like, like, like jazz and understand other stuff, they're like into other things. And just some people just are not, they, they know nothing about it. As soon as they talk about it, you realize like, oh, you've never even listened to any of that. You should, <laughs> you should like find out what makes uh, some of these other artists great that have a different objective when they play guitar. And, and, and in the case of jazz, just a very, just a whole different set of music theory, just, a, just a whole mentality that some people are missing. Mm. Super smart. Yeah. It, it's interesting. The point that you uh, brought up around like the training data for AI and the, the one, one of the obstacles, cause this was also related to video generation and text generation is you know, what happens when you run out of data to train it on based on like human data. And yeah, I'm not an expert in, in AI, but, but I remember hearing about this specific issue. Apparently they found some pretty promising results from AI being able to train based on generative data that the AI created. So it's like, it's improving by being able to like generate and simulate like extra, extra things. So that might be a potential thing that the AI is able to like iterate on over time is actually to like generate new you know things and then be able to like iterate based on it but we'll you know we'll, we'll see what happens with that um, we'll see but we won't have to wait long <laughs> yeah we'll see soon <laughs> that's that's true yeah it's it's rapidly advancing so w one of the one of the points that you brought up was just around like building a community around your local music music scene and your local musicians mm -hmm. and you, know, you mentioned that nowadays it's easier than ever to actually find people near you that are making music and connect with them where would be your go-to place like if you were let's say you moved to a completely new city and you're like you know what i, I want to find some artists to like collaborate with or i want to kind of dig into the music scene locally how would you go about doing that like what specifically would you search for what websites and and how, how do you build those relationships yeah i would just go to a local a physical space i would go to a local show local shows around here tend to be four or five local bands so if you go to a big show there's a national band and an opener, and you guys may know sometimes the opener pays to actually play that show, but you you may not meet either of them. You're not going to meet the big band. You're probably not going to meet the opener either. Even in the audience, you it's hard to talk to anyone else. You're kind of like you're only going to see the people right next to you. In Baltimore, we have so many different places, but they're like them in every town. I would go to, I would go to find a live music club that's going to have like four or five openers. Those those type of bands are going to be in the room the whole time. It's all going to be local music fans. It wouldn't take long to catch on. I went to the to for Grammy week. I was at the Grammys a couple months ago, and there was a showcase at this little restaurant, and there was not many people there. And some of them were like award winning musicians, like good players. I and because I had gone to the Grammys the year before, I knew like several people that were playing it. They all told me to come to this. I'm like, oh, cool. Three or four people that I know are playing this showcase, and when I went there, I met so many people. And the next day, it was like I was a local with them. Like as I was at the next event, I'm seeing all them. All of them are talking to me. Like, what's what's new? And it's like I just met you yesterday. There's a couple of new things that happened in the past, like you know, ten hours. But but we became we became friends. I find it easy to if you're if you're with other musicians, it's just easy to talk to. You know, you have that in common. And uh, so you just need to find where musicians are. Maybe a music store, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never, I never like what I'm hearing if I walk into Guitar Center to be honest. But, but yeah, I would go to a place where people are actually playing shows here. There's like Metro Gallery and there's, there's just different uh, venues here. So if I was to tr to drop into another town, which I have literally done, and it it works for me, I'll just go to a show, uh, or if I find a musician, I'll be like, where do people like to play around here? Try to look for bands that are doing original music that I think are going to be worth checking out. If I you know, live music at a, at a bar that's like bands, play, one band all night playing covers. That's definitely not what I'm talking about. No 
disrespect to that. I'm saying if you see four or five, six, seven bands, which is ridiculous, but that's just how we do it. <laughs> and each of them has like 20 or 30 people watching them if they did a good job. That's what I'd be looking for. <laughs> and then um, and then just find the find the best musicians in that. Cool. Yeah, that's inspired me. I, I would love to. I've been thinking this for a little while. I'm you know, very busy. You got the three kids running a modern musician. But, mm. you know, I've been thinking for a while. I'd love to connect with the local music scene here. I grew up in Vermilion, South Dakota. So very different place than where I am now in Orlando. But I think based on this conversation, I'm just going <clears> to <throat> I'm going to do a better job of connecting with the local music scene, finding you know, some venues like that, attending some shows and starting to build some uh, local network with the, the music scene here. Good. Yeah, you should do that. It's easy to do. And bands also, they regroup, rename, split up. So sometimes you meet a couple of people and you find that there's just a few people that are really active that are, that are next year might be in a different band with a couple of different people, but it's, it's those people. So, I mean, I've been doing this in Baltimore for 25 years now. So, I mean, I do kind of know everybody. Like if I go to a place, like I'm going to know like most of the bands playing, it's, it's, it's getting a little ridiculous, but, but it's, it's, you, you find that it's even when it seems like there's a lot of people, there's there's still a small kind of core group that are booking the shows that are that are playing and, and bringing people out. And uh, it's not too hard to figure out who they are if you just watch it for a, a certain amount of time. It doesn't have to be a long time, but you, you get the hang of it. You'll you'll know you can find out in Orlando where the live where the good live music is. Again, original live music, which is very different than than cover bands and and who books them. And that's what I've been doing when I got started. A lot of the early bands I recorded now own venues or they, they're booking agents or they're managers. So, so I had these like great connections, but that's because we were friends and we all kind of came up together and we stayed in the music scene. So the only mm. friends I've retained from school are my music friends. The other ones, I don't know what they're doing. Every once in a while, one of them adds me, they're like a realtor or whatever. And which, which is cool, you know, but it's like, I, I don't know. I hadn't kept up with this person, but this other guy that was always a good blues guitarist, I still see him at shows. He, he does lessons. He teaches the school of rock with the kids and he plays and, and then I get to meet their, their fellow musicians. If I go out to a show, will introduce me to the other people. And, and again, if, you, if you're just there, if you're there in the actual physical space community with people, it's pretty easy to meet people, especially if you come there with that intention. And not in, mm -hmm. a, not in a pushy way, like, but don't go around like handing your business card to everybody and like, like don't be fake about it. But like, go and be like, I'm hanging out here tonight. I'm not looking for the first way out. Um, one more tip there for bands. If you're playing a show, I don't know why this needs to be said, but stay there the whole time. Some bands will, will somehow only play during their set and then leave. Or when the other bands are playing, very commonly they're backstage or they're in some other place. They play, they pack up, they leave, even while other bands are still playing. Just say, hey, this night is about promoting the band, connecting with fans, finding other bands. Watch the other bands, play your set, hang out and talk to people that you want to talk to. And that's, that's how you build community. Mm. Good stuff, man. Yeah. I mean, that's, it seems like that's really what it's, what's all about. It's about the connecting about the community and, you know, music is, you know, sort of an excuse for us to be able to express ourselves, but to like to be able to, to meet and connect with other, other people. Yeah. So I mean, maybe we can talk a little bit about the mindset of being a producer. And I mean, I, I do think like in particular, with the tools that are evolving so rapidly, the end result is that there's more creativity or the person who's coming up with the ideas or can visualize the thing that they want to create uh, is the one that's you know able to use those tools. Like we're, it's getting more intuitive. Like it becomes easier as long as you have a good sense of taste or you have a good direction, you have a good vision, then it's, it's starting to get easier to be able to actually like actualize that, that vision. So I'm curious from your perspective, you know, as you know, someone that you know lives in this production world, this create creation world, how does someone evolve to become a good producer? Like what are some of the most important fundamentals that are true, regardless of you know whether you're generating a completely analog or in the box or you're using AI tools to supercharge things? What are some of those key roles that come with being a producer? Yeah, well, you're right to identify that the there are concepts that are just going to go across all of these changes that are just it regardless of the medium things that are always going to be important when it comes to understanding the heart of a song developing that song what it takes to write a good song that hasn't really changed genres change of course these mediums these formats change but that's not as significant like in the in the grand scheme of things what makes a song great 
what makes it connect with people. So I think when you're a writer, it's always best to listen to a lot of music to understand stuff and to find what makes you unique. So for songwriters, it's finding what makes you special. That's what I'm looking for as a producer. When I started, I was thinking like, I'm going to be working with bands that aren't developed yet and aren't on major labels. So they're all going to be like super experimental. I'm going to be doing like styles of music that don't exist yet. And we're going to write the rules for them. And I love the chance to do that. It's not every day like I had thought it would be because some people really are fitting into a genre and that's okay. I, I feel like I'm being a little harsh sometimes, but these are, these are just my opinions. Actually, that's the other thing. Producers tend to be pretty opinionated. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to own that. When I, when I started like 311 and like some like kind of rap core stuff was popular. It was a little after like rage had already like to me, like done it. Like that's the sound, like they created the sound super like big guitar with low gain single note sometimes like just breaking the rules of what makes guitar work just doing all the energy in the the lyrical content and just the delivery of it and it's got this aggression to it but it's not double tracked drop tuned guitars and then when i would see people chasing that sound later i'm like ah oh, it doesn't have the spark that that band did so why are we trying to trying to sound like that style so for songwriters i think find your own style find your own voice and then my job as a producer or any producer you go to is to understand that and develop to develop that and bring that out and not try to make you sound like a another artist or or just to just have their own sound. Some producers have their own style, but a lot of the a lot of the best ones just work with so many different bands and you know they just they care about what song they're working on and they're doing it for the artist and not for themselves they're not going to just make everyone sound the same just have different singers over the same beat they're going to they're going to work with the different sounds and so that's definitely what i try to do when a, when a band comes in like right now i'm working with the american jet set kind of almost like a, a arena rock like throwback kind of sound we got these big gang vocals like, like a bon jovi kind of sound that's what we're going for with them and that's like all about that and then i do a lot of indie stuff that like is like just the total thing everything has to sound so like kind of low-key and just and just cool and hip and like you're not trying like <laughs> it's a different like attitude mm -hmm. and that affects how you mic things mm -hmm. it affects a lot of things and i think again the the human element comes into play for that where you're just not like this is what a bass sounds like what what style is this person doing all right we're gonna do finger style bass we're gonna amp it and we're gonna keep the mic really far back or we're gonna go real punchy we're gonna we're gonna put a pick and we're gonna run it through some some drive and we're gonna get a real close sound so understanding the feel based on what the song is, is just an important part of, of what I'm doing. And that's why I like to have a lot of tools. It, you, you had mentioned the analog digital like switch. One thing was it made a lot of things easier. And as you said, the generative stuff makes it easier. Having the tools easier to use is good. I don't like to fight with my equipment. I want it to just work for me. I record on an analog board and they have a lot of problems. So if you're going to record it on an analog board, be ready to solder stuff. Be ready to, to start to hear a track crackle and cut out i don't like that when i'm working on a song i want it mm -hmm. i want everything that i put in there to remain in there i don't want the tape to wear out and stretch and the high end to start to disappear because we hit play on the bridge too much that used to be a problem we used to be like we have to move on we can't keep playing this section of the songs we're wearing the t literally wearing the tape out <laughs> so i use a lot of analog methods capturing the sound microphones of course are you know physical analog things and then a classic eqs neve api into classic tube compressors love tube compressors love my la2a on vocals i think it's just magical but then once it gets into pro tools which is what i use now it stays sounding the way i wanted it to which which is great when synthesizers first came out you had to create the sound completely you just got some waveforms and i have some analog synths they're great they have definitely limits limits so then start to get other keyboards where you can play a string pad and it sounds very much like real string. So I like that. I like being able to, to have a lot of sounds right there. I flip through the different sounds. When the Beatles wanted a Wurlitzer, you had to bring a Wurlitzer in. If they wanted a Mellotron, you had to roll a Mellotron into the place. If you wanted a pipe organ, you had to go to where a church was. You couldn't even move one of them around. So, so now I could just flip to a pipe organ sound. So I like having the sounds at my disposal. I think all that stuff's good, but you, you gotta just still know what you want to do with the song. You still have to be an arranger. You still have to understand the song. And I think that remains universal, whether you're mm. analog, digital, robot, understanding the, the song and, and what it's going for. And if, if these sounds are more accessible, that's good. I don't mind. I don't think you need to fight for the sounds. I don't think they need to be expensive, costly to get. I have a lot of physical, like the real stuff. Like I have a lot of good real amps that I like. There are plug-in amps that, that 
sound pretty good. I, I definitely prefer the real ones, but you can still create with them. You don't have to say, I can't make a song right now because I don't have a PV5150 and a, and a big cabinet and mic. So you can plug right into something and, and get that sound. Now, I'm a little pickier, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I like having the real one, but it, it's not a limit. So if you're a songwriter, you don't need to say, I can't write a song until I get this or get that. You have the tools on, on any laptop right now to, to get you started. Mm. So good. Awesome. So, I mean, to, to recap, it sounds like what you're saying is that a good place to start is by you know, listening to a bunch of songs and understanding you know, the things that you resonate and to be inspired and to see totally. the things you resonate with, to be able to determine what is it about those things that resonate with you and what is it that's unique about you that, that actually is different from all those different, all those different things that you're inspired by. And once you have that, then, you know, the tools, you know, you can, there's a lot of different tools around you can use. It's easier than ever now to actually produce music. There's less limitations, but it still kind of comes from that place of creativity and sort of articulating what is it that makes you special. Yeah. Awesome. Well, hey, Tony, man, it's been great uh, connecting today. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on here and share you know, some lessons and insights from 25 plus years in the, in the music industry. So for anyone that's uh, nice. listening to this right now is interested in connecting more or, I don't know, reaching out related to music, collaboration, things, what would be the best place for them oh. to go to dive deeper? Oh. Always up for that. I guess I still use Facebook. Facebook's probably how I get the most like messages, uh, but I have my information on my website, email, um, text. I get a lot of music questions and I try to answer them. Um, people will s just send me just very random things. <laughs> like I'm trying to hook these two things up or whatever. I try to help out and just some people will follow me on, on Instagram, the deep end studio. And, and then I like to look at what other people are doing and they'll comment on things. And sometimes bands will find each other through my comment section or just through, I'll share bands I'm working with. And then I'll see another band's doing a show with them or whatever. And, and then they'll tell me, Oh, I saw them on your Instagram and that's how I connected. So I mentioned that about booking people. There's just some people I know in the area that are just connected to so many people. So if you're in the Baltimore music scene, you want to find people. I humbly submit, if you follow me, you'll, you'll find a lot of them. Cause I'm just, that's just what I do all the time. It's just, these are all my friends. So kind of use me to find more people. That's, that's cool with me. So find Tony Corelli on Facebook, the Penn studio on Instagram. You had a discord. Um, I, I mm -hmm. just made one. You said that I've heard about Discord. I, I hadn't done it yet, but now I just made one. I don't do anything on Twitter. I, I made a LinkedIn years ago and I shouldn't have because every once in a while I'll check it and I got messages from people that think I'm going to read it. So it, I do have a little bit of a hard time um, keeping up with everything. I do really long days in the studio. So, I mean, lately I've been, I was doing full days with this band. Like we would do like 12 hour days and I just took on this big mixing project and I was just in the middle of the night working on other music to like, three four in the morning every day and then you know up again uh, another session at 10 in the morning it was it gets a little crazy <laughs> but i'm glad i like doing it i'm glad it's enjoyable work <laughs> that's important yeah for putting in hours like that it's important that it's something that that really helps you plug in cool well tony like always we'll put all the links in the show notes for easy access cool thanks and let's let's give a virtual round of applause for oh. yeah <laughs> <laughs>